this first mentioned in the Bible, in the Old Testament? So let's just put out the New Testament quickly. And where is it first mentioned? Okay. Do you all know the day that Moses came down the mountain and his face was shone because he met with God? And it was the day that he walked down with the Ten Commandments. It's the same day. It was the day that the law was given. And it was, they were all together, the Israelites, in such expectation. What is Moses going to bring from his time in the presence of God? What is he going to come and tell us? What did God say? And they were together with this expectation. And Moses came with the Ten Commandments and his face shone. They couldn't even look at him. He had to wear a veil because he had such an encounter with God that nobody could look at him. And we come into the presence of God in the same way. And we just blase about it. Oh, it's not just what happens on some Sundays. We don't realize that that same God that made Moses shine like a light, that nobody could even look at him. He had an encounter like we had. You see, the Pentecost means 50. It is 50 days after the Passover. It is seven weeks. So seven times seven is 49 weeks. It is the Pentecost that they celebrated in the Old Testament was the Monday, the day, well, the Sunday, the day after the Sabbath, because their Sabbath was Saturday. It was the day after that they celebrated it. It was the 50th day. The 49 days would have passed yesterday, and then on the 50th day, they got together and Moses came with it. And it was the celebration of the first fruits. It was the, one of the three feasts that God instructed them to keep. And uh, they had to keep the Passover. And then seven weeks later, and one day, they had to bring their first fruit from the harvest. Whatever they had earned in that seven weeks, whatever they produced in that seven weeks, if it was a lamb or a bull or a, uh, some wheat, or some barley, or whatever they produced, they brought all of it, not 10% of it, all of it to God, because it was the first fruit. And God then blessed them from there, and for the rest of the year they brought a tithe. So if I said to you, your January salary, January was like a good month. Right? We all have lots of spare cash in January. Okay, January, I want your whole salary in church. No, I'm joking, but I'm just saying the principle of first fruit is that when I receive something for the first time, I dedicate it to God. I say it all belongs to Him. And they were together, and they received, there was a whole expectation of the law to be given. They were excited, waiting for Moses to bring the law. Now, and they became a nation... Once they had a law, the Israelites came out of Egypt, but they were not a nation until you had a law. Any of you that has formed any thing, a church or a non-profit organization will say to you, the first thing they ask you is the constitution. You cannot say we're a church if we don't have a constitution. There must be a law before the country is recognized. And they became a country the moment God, they became a nation the moment Moses brought the law. That's the Old Testament version. What happens in the New Testament? We did last week, we, God promised us that when Jesus goes away, he will send to us the helper. Okay. So... I was going to talk quite a lot about the Old Testament, but there it is done with. 
So in the New Testament, it celebrates the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and it celebrates the harvest of many people turning to God, and it celebrates the start of the church. In Acts 2, this is such a well-known scripture, but we cannot but read it. There's just nothing else we can read on the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, so it was already called Pentecost when they were there. They were all together for this celebration. They were there with their first fruit. If it be a lamb or a bull or like I said just now. So now in the New Testament, Jesus is gone, but they're still carrying on with the Jewish fest. <laughs> Festivals. Okay, sure, I managed it. Um, they carried on with the Jewish festivals. <laughs> and here they are together, expecting it just to be a normal Pentecost. Just a time when they bring their first fruit. And they're excited about bringing their gift to God. And they're most probably checking each other out a bit. Imagine if you could see each other's gifts here in church. Okay? All right. So he's bringing a lamb. Now he's just bringing a dove. Now he's bringing a bull. And you sort of like check each other out. What, are you, what is your tithe? What are you giving? Okay? But praise God. We can't see what each other are giving. But uh, so they've all come together for the normal Pentecostal festival. And it says they were together in one place and with one mind. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Don't tell me you can have church at your home. Yes, you can. But it can never replace when God is doing, when all is in one place, in one accord. And it's not only to get together, you have to get your heart into one accord. You have to deal with your heart. Because I'll tell you, every single one sometimes doesn't feel like being here. But you leave that feeling at the door. You lay down and say, God, I'm here. Not because I feel like being here. I'm here to be like they were in Acts 2. In one place and in one accord. And suddenly, not slowly, not over a period of time, not little by little, there's a place for that, but there's also the God of suddenlies. The God that looks like nothing's happening. Nothing's changing. I'm sowing and sowing and sowing. I'm serving and serving and serving. I'm letting go of my addictions one by one, but nothing seems to be changing. And then suddenly God comes in and everything changes. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. As of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. I was watching the people in front here. Now, the bulk of the people that are in front here are those that come regularly to pray. Something changes at prayer. Something changes on a Saturday night that manifests here on a Sunday morning. And as the presence of God came, the tongues just came out. They didn't have to put it on or switch it on or off. But as they went on their knees right here, tongues came. As if it was the day of Pentecost. Yeah. As if it was that first day of Pentecost. I know not everybody can come to prayer. And I know that and I understand that. But don't neglect the preparation for Sunday. Don't neglect spending time in prayer and saying, Lord, touch me so that on Sunday morning I can have that flame of fire on my head. Change me during Friday and Saturday. That when I come here on Sunday... I don't come with all my pain and hurts and drama and disappointments and stuff just so that I can get a little bit of a petrol fill up to get through the year, my week 
to come here next week again like I'm coming to a petrol station. You are the petrol station. You are the fountain flowing from inside of you. Churches be the place where it's flowing from inside of you, not the place where you get the filling. There's a time and a period in your life that you've got to come just to be filled because you've been hurt and damaged. And I understand that. And I've many times in my life been there. But don't camp there, people. Don't make that your dwelling place. Where you come to church just to get that little bit to try and get through the next week or month. Come to church so that you can bubble up from the inside. There appeared uh, to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And as they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused. When last has somebody been confused because of your actions? Somebody else is saying, hey, why? What? What are you doing, man? I think you're crazy. There must be some response when people see you being a Christian. If everybody is just, oh, it's nice that you're a Christian, but my okay, you've lost something. You've lost it. And I must be the first one that many times in my life, my Christianity had no effect on those around me. So I'm not preaching to you, I'm preaching to us. Saying our Christianity has to be something that confuses the world and says to them, I don't know what you've got, but I want it. I don't understand what's happening, but I want it to happen to me too. And sometimes they might think you're a little bit crazy. What does the next verse say? They think they are drunk. When last has somebody thought that you're drunk? Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are these not all Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one in our own language? I want to add there, they heard that in their heart language. They might have been able to speak many languages. But God wants to speak to you in your heart language. That language that you really get intimate with. That language that you understand. I don't care if you're Zulu or Afrikaans or English or so on. Understand that God can really hear your voice. And he can speak your heart language. And he can allow the word to get through. Because certain times we put barriers up to certain languages. But God says, I want to get past all of those by speaking to you in your heart language. And each of us in our own language in which we were born. And then he mentions a whole lot of nations. And they all heard it in their own language. Verse 12. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? They had such a thing happening in church. That everybody that walked past, everybody that came past, everybody that gathered to see what's going on was saying, what can this mean? And that's what I'm trusting for, for Frontline. That people say, what's going on on that plot in your hand road? We don't understand it. They're a crazy bunch. Maybe they're drunk. Others mockingly said they were full of new wine. Oh, I want them to say that we're full of new wine. I want them to cry out and say, they must be drunk. And then the famous words. But Peter, standing on the, up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only nine o'clock or third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, these guys had all been studying the word since they were young. And they were hoping for this day of Joel to come. This day that he had been prophesied so long ago. And it came and they didn't recognize it. 
They thought it was drunkenness. And this is what's happening in the church today. We're praying and praying and praying for revival. And the moment it happens, we think those oaks are crazy. We think they're missing it. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons will prophesy. And your young men will see visions. No, it says your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Don't let anybody ever tell you that you're not the right gender to minister. Men, what's happening in the world today, so many women are standing up and serving God. We better keep up. Well, otherwise they're going to run ahead of us. Men, get your stuff together and make sure that the women don't run ahead of us. Because God says he's looking for an available person. Doesn't matter if it's a son or a daughter. I will pour out on sons and daughters. The young men shall see visions, and the old men shall dream dreams. So he's trying to say young and old, male and female. Now is there anybody excluded if I say that? Who doesn't fall within either of those groups? You will all fall in two of those groups. You're either a young daughter or an old man or another combination, but you'll be two of those things. And God says he's going to do it on both of them. So both two things that you are, you're either an old man or a young man or an old daughter or a young daughter. But on both things that you are, he says he's going to pour out his spirit. Amen. So are you included? Yes. I will pour out my spirit on my men servants and on my maid servants. He's reiterating it that it's on both. And then he puts the word servanthood to it. Those who's going to serve me. I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. Not only those who's got the calling of a prophet and trained as a prophet and done anything. Each one of us has got enough of the spirit inside of us to operate. There's people sitting here who love so dearly. They just love anybody that's struggling. God says, I'm going to take that love. And channel it into my kingdom. That which you love and the emotion that you feel for people. God says, I've seen that love. And allow me to activate that love into ministry. That care that you have for the broken. God says, I want that. I want your heart. Because I'm looking for men and women that has got a heart to care for the broken. I'm not looking for those that got it all together. I'm looking for those with a heart. And as you get it and saying, I am going to serve God, I'm going to take this love and let it be molded and shaped inside the kingdom of God. You are going to see a harvest like you've never seen before. Because Satan can also take you out with that very emotion. Because you've got so much care and you don't know how to apply it. Satan will hurt you again and again and again. But when you take that care and you give it to God, say, God, make a ministry out of this, something will be activated in your life. You see, so we are celebrating today the day that Christianity became a nation. Christianity became a whole thing because uh, the Spirit visited us. It said he'll pour out his flesh. Um, verse 23. I'm oh, sorry, 21. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, anybody here who's not part of whoever, any one of you, doesn't matter what you're going through, doesn't matter what your background is, doesn't matter what your future is, doesn't matter if other people look down or other people respect you, God says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's the message that we carry out. We're so blessed by the prayer walks. 
people going out and taking the word out of our little homes so that somebody might call upon the Lord. And verse 22, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by law lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. You see, the day of Pentecost is rooted in the resurrection. Satan thought he had won when Jesus was put to death. But it was all part of God's plan. He said his pain could not hold him in death, and he's come out. And today he's doing something here that you can see. Verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Man, so powerful. Let all the house of Israel know this, that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, he's made him both Lord and Christ. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do if our church doesn't lead you to that place? If any church that you go to doesn't lead you to the place where you say, What shall I do? That you are cut to the heart and stop going to that church or coming here. If that doesn't happen, where God speaks to you and say to you, What? Oh, that you respond and saying, what must I do? How do I fix this that is wrong? If there's not some conviction of a process that God's busy with you, not sometimes that you get cut to the heart. I sit in this church and myself, and I get cut to the heart during the worship. I get cut to the heart while somebody's preaching. And sometimes even while I'm preaching, I realize that I've got to change things. Can't stay the way I am. And I cry out, God, what shall I do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children. Now some people say the Holy Spirit was only supposed to fall on that day for the people that are that day, that were there. But now let's just look at this scripture. And he said, for the promise is to you and to your children. And to all that are afar off. And as many as the Lord our God will call. So as long as God is calling, the promise is still true. Is God still calling? All of us. Some stage or other, we heard God calling. I, so many of you, there's been a day that you come to me and say, I want to get baptized. I want to give my life to Christ. I want to change. Because you heard the call of God. And I heard the call of God. My wife heard it and my children heard it. And the leadership has heard it. So as long as God is calling, because it says, as many as the Lord our God will call, so the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God is calling. So as long as God is calling, this promise of the Holy Spirit is still true. Yeah. So don't ever believe that God is finished and they can't do it for you. And verse 40, And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. If that generation was called the perverse generation, then what are you going to call today? Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. 
Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold all their possessions and divided them among all, as anyone had need. You cannot be part of the household and see need and say, well, it doesn't affect me. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, church and home cell. It's exactly what they did right there. And they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Oh, Lord Jesus, that's what we pray for. Let us enjoy our moments with gladness of heart. Let coming to church and coming to home cell not be something that drags out and that we have to do. But let it be something that we want to do. Let it be something that we want to do with all of our heart. There's an Afrikaans word, smach. I so smach, mother. I don't know what the English word is for it. But I so long for being together with my brothers and sisters. Because I know every time we get together, I get impacted by the power of God. So they couldn't stay away. Every time the doors opened, they were there. They didn't just get there once a week to tick off, okay, well, I was in church this week. They had a longing to be by him. Let's sing worthy. Let's stand and sing that song again about you are worthy.